Okay, very good. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, so um, yeah, so before I take up this question uh, uh, about Lagrange multipliers, now let me um, just uh, finish what we did uh, last lecture and then uh, we'll go to Lagrange multipliers and the critical points, second derivative test and all these things. Okay. So uh, one of the things that uh, I didn't do, uh, and I meant to do, was uh, directional derivative. So for directional derivative, uh, we need uh, basically three things, a function, maybe two variable function or a three variable function, it doesn't matter. And we also need a unit vector, uh, u equal to unit vector. We also needed a point, a particular point, a P, which is like uh, x0, y0, z0. Uh, so this vector, uh, you remember, was unit vector. So we had this unit vector u. And uh, notation was this, d, f, u, at this point. Uh, OK, at p, for example. So this quantity, there was a definition. This was rate of change of the function as you moved along the straight line that starts at P and moves along this vector U. As you approach the point P, you take the rate of change and see how much your function is changing in that direction. And that's direction of derivative. So the name is very suggestive. So that was the definition. And uh, you remember that we drive the formula, we proved something very nice about this, that it can be calculated using gradient. So there was this formula. So this turns out to be equal to um, gradient of f dot u. So this is a wonderful formula because it just tells us that if we know how to calculate uh, derivatives of f in these two or three particular directions, then we know its uh, variation or its rate of change along any direction. So that's uh, by just taking that product. So this is this very useful formula. So a corollary of this formula was that the maximum rate of change so maximum rate of change occurs in the direction u should be gradient of f divided by um, normal gradient of f. Why we divided by this uh, norm or magnitude? Because gradient need not be a unit vector. It could be any vector. So we just divide by its length to make it a unit vector. That's natural. Um, so this is the direction that gives us the maximum rate of change. And then the rate of change itself or directional derivative, let's go and compute it and uh, see what we get uh, for that. So if you compute here, the directional derivative, oh, sorry. Yeah, I've been, Sneezing, uh, so that's why I didn't want to come to class. I, I did not want to put anyone in any, there's nothing, I'm not even uh, quarantining myself, but 
I just wanted to, to make sure. So I'm just coughing and sneezing. That's, that's all. It's, it's nothing. Uh, so that's why I didn't want to come to class. So u is equal to gradient of f divided by normal gradient of f. This is df u p. So this becomes a gradient of f then times gradient of f divided by normal gradient of f. So the final answer is that uh, df u at p is equal to uh, normal gradient of f. So that's the formula, that's very nice formula. This tells us that the maximum rate of change is exactly the value of the length of the gradient vector, right? So maximum rate of change is equal to normal gradient. So this gradient now has uh, interpretation. We know its direction has a meaning. It's a, it's, 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 it has two meanings actually. It's a direction that gives us the maximum rate of change. And also it's a direction that's normal to the tangent uh, surface. I mean, to, yeah, indeed, it's normal to the tangent surface to the level curve. And its magnitude is exactly. So, so let me give you an example. Any questions about this? Um, a Lagrange multiply problem that I would like to know how to solve is show that of all the triangles inscribed in a circle of radius r, the collateral triangle has the largest perimeter. Okay, I'll do this problem in, uh, if you make an office hour with me, I'll do it in the office hour with you. Uh, it'll take uh, some, some, some uh, extra time to do that, <laughs> yeah. Is it the dot product on the numerator for the uh, dot product in the numerator? Yes, this is the dot product, thank you, yes. This is the dot product, and I did the simplification. So this is norm of gradient of f squared divided by norm of gradient of f. So there is one factor drops, and then you get norm of gradient. Okay. Great. Very good. Okay. So uh, now uh, let me uh, ask uh, this question. Um, in which direction uh, the function Um, f of x, y, z equal to um, sine of uh, x, y times z. This is sine of x, y, and then z is outside the sine uh, notation. Okay. In which direction this function? Um, as smallest rate of change at the point um, p equal to zero, one, one. Okay, that's, uh, that's the question. Okay, so this question is not asking for maximum rate of change, it's asking for minimum rate of change. But obviously the minimum rate of change if uh, in this direction, in the direction of gradient, you have the maximum rate of change, 
then in the direction of the negative of the gradient, you have the smallest rate of change. I mean, uh, and in fact, the rate of change in the negative direction of the gradient is negative because if you multiply with that formula, you get a negative of this, okay? So all we have to do, we have to compute the gradient in this problem. Um, so gradient of f is uh, derivative of this guy with respect to x. So with respect to x becomes y. Derivative of this guy with respect to x, this sine of x, y matters. And derivative of sine of x, y with respect to x is y cosine of x, y times z. That's the first coordinate, right? The next coordinate, we have to take derivative with respect to y. Derivative with respect to y is, derivative of that function with respect to y is x cosine of, again, x, y, z. And derivative of this function with respect to z is just sine of x, y. So remember now, I, the vector has three components. This is the first component of the gradient, second component, and third component. So let's first of all compute the gradient at 0, 1, 1. At 0, 1, 1. Gradient at 0, 1, 1. That is equal to you just have to put values here. So uh, x is 0, y and 1 are 0. If this is 0, this cosine is 1, 1, 1. So this is 1. And for this one, x is 0, so this is 0. And for the last one, because x is 0, sine of 0 is 0 is 0. So luckily, this is a unit vector. So we don't have to normalize it. But we have to take the negative direction, right? So the answer is in the direction. of u equal to negative gradient of f divided by norm of gradient of f which is negative just one zero zero this function has the smallest rate of change smallest rate of change and in fact this rate of change is negative so this is a particular situation if the gradient is not zero if you go in the direction of the negative of the gradient then you you will drop you will drop the value of your function by some amount, uh, which is the maximum amount. Well, minimum amount. <laughs> maximum in value, but minimum in uh, exact, uh, I mean, maximum in magnitude, but minimum in value. As the smallest rate of change um, in the direction, you, equal to negative uh, so this is the direction but the, but but you may be asked also the second question a second question is what is that value and the value of rate of change
is equal to negative gradient of f. Well, in this case, everything is easy because this is a unit vector by itself. Uh, the gradient is already a unit vector, so this is one, so negative one. So in this problem, we did two things. We found the gradient, we found the negative of the gradient direction, and also we found the value. So these are typical questions that uh, stay forward, but you have to know what you're doing. I mean, otherwise, pretty easy questions. Any questions about this or before we can go? Okay. Very good. So now, uh, indeed, uh, we covered uh, this. So now let me tell you a li little bit about uh, maximum, minimum, and Lagrange multipliers um, questions. So, So here, here is a is, is a typical problem you can you can face. Um, find so example is this. So this is of Lagrange multipliers. So. Uh, so the question is, uh, for example, uh, like this. Find absolute maximum and absolute minimum Um, of the function so let's take a function like f of x and y maybe f of x y and z equal to x plus y plus z Um, well, I, I will, I, I'm, going, I'm going to say x minus y plus 2z. Subject to the constraint um, x2 plus y2 plus the two less than equal to two. Okay. So the question is fine, absolute maximum and absolute minimum. Uh, but now I'm asking another question after this. At what points this maximum and minimum occur, right? At what points? These values are attained. To say attained is almost like to say obtained, but uh, they are not the same. Attained has a different connotation, but that's essentially means the same thing. At what points these values are attained? Okay, so. Remember now, uh, this is important because sometimes in, 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 in assignments, in exams, you go on and find the values uh, that, which is the maximum minimum value, but you don't specify the point that's. So the, the, the point is different from the value of the function at that point. In this case, we have asked to do both. So be aware of that, right? Otherwise, it's okay. So. Let's first understand this problem. 
what is the constraint in this problem? The constraint uh, says x2 y2 z2 less than equal to 2. So what does that mean? That means that we can be inside the sphere of radius root 2 or on the boundary of the sphere, right? But not out of this sphere. So the constraint, this constraint, kind of tells us where we have to look for solutions. So this is a uh, radius root two, and uh, you should not look out of this thing. You should just be here inside or on the boundary. Now, we don't know uh, if the maximum or minimum is going to be of this function is going to be inside of the sphere or on the boundary of the sphere. So we have to argue uh, in both cases. What I'm saying is that, what I'm saying is that we have to first assume that you are inside and then in that case, we can use the usual critical point theorem, theorem and Fermat's uh, theorem. But if you are on the boundary, then we cannot use Fermat's theorem. Remember that there was this serious issues about Fermat's theorem is not applicable on the boundary. In the interior, it is applicable. So I just, uh, case one, in the interior, So interior really means x2, y2, z2 less than 2. OK, so in the interior, if we have a even local maximum or minimum, uh, let alone absolute, if there is a local max or mean, Then, at that point, Fermat's theorem holds. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that we have to take partial derivatives of this guy with respect to x, y, z, put them equal to zero, and solve the system of equations. Let's do that. In this case, df dx equal to zero, df dy equal to zero, df dz equal to zero. Okay, so we have got that. Okay, three equations, three unknowns. In this case, it's very simple because you just get one equal to zero. For the second one, you get minus one equal to zero. And for the third one, you get two equal to zero. Don't worry about that. This is actually good. It means that there are no solutions inside. So we should not look in vain for a solution inside the sphere. There are no solutions because this system of equations obviously has no solutions. Okay. So don't worry about that one, you got one equal to zero, da, da, da. No, there is no contradiction. There is no, uh, nothing, no, you know, it doesn't mean that mathematics is wrong or anything. It just, the, the assumption of Fermat's theorem was that if, that's a big if, if there is a solution, then it must satisfy this equation. But this equation is not satisfiable, so it means that there is no solution. The logic is the, in, in, in the reverse direction. Anyhow, so this implies that 
no solutions in the interior. Okay, so that's very good. So the le what is left is on the boundary then. We have to look at on the boundary. For the boundary, uh, the, the condition is this, x2 plus y2 plus z2 equal to 2. So this is the boundary constraint. Constraint. Okay. And that's exactly what Lagrange multiplies method is designed to do for us. Lagrange multiplier method exactly for the case where you have a constraint which is of the form of, of an exact equation. This is an exact equation. Uh, less than equal to two was an inequality and Lagrange does not apply to that overall. So we have to separate two cases in the interior on the boundary. Now we are on the boundary, so Lagrange applies. Okay. So Lagrange multiplier applies. So we have got now um, equations like this, uh, fx equal to lambda gx fy equal to lambda gy, fz equal to lambda gz, and g equal to zero. There are four equations, four unknowns, and g uh, of x, y, z, remember, is this equation, x2 plus y2 plus z2, minus two. I wrote it minus two so that g equal to zero gives me the equation that we want. Right. Okay, so let's uh, set up this problem and solve it. Okay, so we have, we have calculated fx. fx is equal to one is equal to lambda times, uh, this guy is uh, due to respect to x is two x f y is minus y equal to lambda to y. The other one is, um, okay, two equal to lambda to z. So here we get x is equal to one over uh, two lambda. y is equal to negative one over two lambda, z is equal to lambda, one over lambda. Okay, so this is uh, what we get in this case. You see, this, is, this was a very lucky situation. In a problem that you had like in your assignment, it was assigned first and then uh, so it was not noticed that the system of equations that you can, so you can you, you, you get, you got in that case, it was very hard to solve. It was not solvable by hand. You had to use some software to solve that. So that's why we changed the problem. Uh, so hard questions can happen, hard systems, uh, but the systems that you will get they will be solvable by hand. So we are not going to give you a system that in, 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 in the final, in the exam, that is not solvable, you would need some calculator or some, some software or anything, no. It's gonna be easily solvable by hand. Rather easily, but certainly by hand. Okay, anyhow, so this is uh, very easy to settle because uh, we have to sub into the equation.
So we can sub in these values into this equation, right? If you sub in, but G is this actually here. This is the equation. So we get uh, one over two lambda squared plus minus one over two lambda squared plus one over lambda squared is equal to two. So this is just one over lambda squared times quarter plus quarter plus one is equal to two. So one over lambda squared. Well, this is just four and this is uh, one plus one plus four is equal to two. So we get that, uh, oh my God, what I did. That's very bad, minus two here, sorry, minus two. Remember, the constraint is not x2 plus y2 plus z2, it's negative two also. So we have to subtract by two. That's equal to four. This is, um, okay, I've got six. Um, and then minus eight. I think I, I, I have done a mistake somewhere. Because now I'm getting this is equal to negative two over four. This is negative one over two. And this has no solution that this cannot be true. Uh, we made a mistake somewhere. Yeah, we definitely made a mistake somewhere. Um, uh, okay, so What are we doing here actually? So let me just uh, raise that. So I've got uh, X is equal to one over two lambda, Y is equal to negative one over two lambda, Z is equal to uh, one over lambda. And then we sub into these equations, we should get, uh, yeah, I mean, um, Two x two y two z. What was the function? The function was x minus y plus two z. So this is okay. So we have got uh, now um, one over lambda squared. Okay, times um, quarter plus quarter plus one minus two equal to zero. Oh, sorry, no, 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 that's, uh, that was my mistake. So no, no, there's, there's no problem. Everything is fine. One over lambda squared times, this is four. And this is, uh, this was my mistake, four. And this is uh, six is equal to two. Okay, so this is two, this is, three, so one over lambda squared is equal to four over three. Lambda squared is equal to three over four. This tells me that lambda is equal to plus minus root three over four. Okay, so we found two solutions. And then what you do, or we should not take more time on this. This is an easy problem after all. Uh, x, y, z, if you put lambda equal to 
root three over four, you get one set of points. If you get lambda equal to the other one, you get another set of points and then, and then, oh my God, I have a lot of comments here. Uh, okay, so first of all, let me finish uh, what I did. So you should, you understand the, the logic here, right? So we found two lambdas and we, we found two points. Now, one thing remains. Which of these points is a maximum point? Which is a minimum point? So basically, uh, we found one point here, A, one point B. And then, uh, so the point A has coordinates uh, for lambda equal to root three over two. Uh, you, you get these coordinates here, right? X is equal to one over two root three over four and minus uh, one over two root three over four and then one over lambda which is one over root three over four. And B is the negative of this, is the opposite value here actually, because the difference between X, Y, Z values at these two points, these are like antipodal points, right? It's a, one of them is one side of the sphere, the other one is the diametrically opposite. They are called antipodal uh, points on this sphere. It's like this. One of them is maximum, the other one is minimum. Now the maximum is uh, this point, because f of a actually turns out to be positive. The value of f of a turns out to be positive, and the value of f of b turns out to be negative. So this is maximum. This is okay. So uh, now, okay. I think on the last line it should be plus two because you moved it to the other side of the equality sign. Um, not really, no. I mean, uh, my equation is, remember my equation is x2 plus y2 plus z2, I mean my constraint, minus two. So I just sub in those values x, y, z that I obtained, and sub into this equation, which is this one exactly. So I was confused there because uh, I was doing something really silly here. <laughs> I mean, I was separating lambda in the wrong way. So lambda is just on the first part. The other parts is not mixed. So this is, uh, no, you know, I think, uh, or is it on the left-hand side now? Yes, it's on the left-hand side. No, you're not dumb, you're, you're very smart and that's, that's the point. In exam, can we write down the answer directly after we found the equation of Lagrange multipliers? No, you cannot. You have to give the reasoning. How did you arrive at that answer? I mean, that's important. In the, in, in the exam, you have to explain your work. I mean, otherwise, how do we know where did you get this from? That's important. Uh, it was a good question, thank you. That comment was from a while ago. It's all fixed now. Okay, great, thank you. Very good, excellent. Excellent, so I think uh, on that last line it should be plus. Yeah, okay, right, right, right. Very good, thanks for your comments, okay. So, yeah, I mean this uh, Lagrange multipliers, it can happen in two ways, right? Either we can give you directly just constraints like that, or we can give you some sort of semi-constraints. So there's an inequality, and then in that case, you have like two problems packed in one problem, right? Uh, one problem is to look for in inside. In that case, then you apply Lagrange multipliers. Uh, sorry, for the inside, you apply Fermat's theorem. So you just put equations equal to zero, right? derivatives equal to zero and so on. And on the boundary use constraint. Now, one thing I should emphasize is that uh, for, for the interior, there is the second derivative test. Let's not forget that. 
In this case, the equation in the interior was easy. There was no solution. But then there is a solution. You have to use second derivative test. So let me mention this because that's, a, that's an important issue. So second derivative test. So we found a point where um, fx x0, y0 equal to 0, and fy x0, y0 equal to 0. So this point is uh, Fermat's equations. These are. OK, but then uh, the, the point is that we don't know if that point, is it a maximum? I mean, local maximum, local minimum, or maybe none of those. It could be none of those. But still, the equations are satisfied, right? And then uh, luckily, this uh, second derivative test, um, in some cases, not always, helps us to decide if the point that we have found, is it the local maximum or local minimum? So we found the uh, second, uh, so this is uh, like this quantity D we formed, which was determinant of this matrix, right? Fxx, all at this point, Fxy, Fxy uh, again, and Fyy. So we find this determinant, which is Fxx, Fyy minus Fxy squared. Because these mixed partials are the same in any order. So we just, uh, so you get this. So then, um, so the second derivative test said that, first of all, if T is positive, And if y y is positive, what could we said in that case? If d is positive, f y y is positive. What could we say in that case? Do you remember? So if D was positive, yeah, exactly. Excellent. Local minimum, yes. So in this case, we have a, we are dealing with a local minimum. Now, I, I give you a kind of a quick way of uh, making sure that you haven't made mistake. If you are in doubt, consider uh, there are three functions that if you remember, you can test everything against those three functions. Those three functions are these ones. F of x, y. equal to x2 plus y2, f of x, y equal to negative x2, negative y2, f of x, y equal to x2 minus y2. So have these three functions in mind. And if you are not sure if you have made a mistake or not, or not test your I mean, uh, answer against these three functions. This is obviously case one, right? First of all, I mean, this is a local minimum. Actually, this is 
absolute minimum, but that doesn't matter. This is local minimum because this function looks like this. Right? It's like a bowl, soup bowl, maybe. And it's, uh, but it goes all the way. It doesn't matter. We just look at this point, which is, this one is a kind of inverted bowl, right? This is local max. This is local mean. So this is case two in this case. Case two, let me write it. D positive and F Y Y negative. This is a um, uh, local minimum, uh, local max, sorry. And if you, Imagine you are in doubt between one and two. You are writing your test uh, exam, whatever, and you are in doubt if one or two is the case. Just check with these examples, and then immediately you know which one is correct. So you will never ever make mistakes again, and you have to memorize much less. This is uh, this case. You see, in this case, d is still positive. The function has, but d is positive because. What is D in this case? Is determinant of minus two, I mean, yeah, minus two, zero, zero, negative two. You see, the reason is fxx is equal, equal to negative two, fyy is equal to negative two, so you get this. But nevertheless, this is equal to four and is positive. But this component is negative. That's why we know that we are in this case. We are in this case, right? All right. And the third case, uh, kind of most interesting, is where you have a saddle point, right? So in this case, D is negative. It's a saddle. Not a maximum, not a minimum. But we are saying more than that, actually. We are not just saying that this is this point is not a maximum, not minimum. We, we are giving more, more information can be obtained in that case. What is that? It's saddle. It really looks like this function. It's really like a horse saddle. And goes the other way on. Right? That, this is the point. So you go in this direction, you're going up, and you're going here down. So this point is neither maximum or minimum. For those hikers that are hiking the mountain along this route, they are going up. They have to spend energy to get up there. For those guys who are skiing down the hill here, they don't spend any energy, they just, roll down with their skis or the, with their, uh, on foot maybe, yeah. So this is the, so have these three functions in mind and these three cases. And the second derivative test is that in all other cases, uh, the test is inconclusive. Uh, what does that mean? It means that anything can happen. Could be local maximum, could be local minimum, could be a saddle, could be something even stranger. There are stranger cases than that, right? So the, maybe in your book or just search, the, this is horse saddle. There are other things called monkey saddle. So they are more complicated shapes near the origin. Depends, so depending on the nature of this function. So 
but we don't deal with those, but we should be able to say that, okay, that's the case where we can't say much. Okay, guys, thank you so much. One thing I should say, don't forget to cast your vote uh, about the course. So please take a few minutes to fill these, uh, what's it called, student questionnaires. Uh, that's your chance to express your views. I mean, our department relies on that. I rely on those things and university also relies on those uh, student evaluations. So it's important you, uh, you express your views. So please uh, do that. Uh, I will send an, uh, a note about that also. So are there any questions or comments? Or? Thank you so much. Uh, so looks like there are no questions now, okay. So guys, have a wonderful weekend and uh, study well. So I'll see you on Monday and then Wednesday, I guess is the last lecture. So, and then next uh, Friday, uh, 7 p.m. is your final. So all the best with your studies. Bye-bye now.